I uh, don't know why. Maybe they liked each other so much that they didn't want to scatter out. Maybe they had kids and grandkids that they wanted to keep in their backyard so that they could see them and visit with them and enjoy them. Uh, maybe they were worried that if they got away from each other in their old age, they wouldn't be taken care of. Kind of scattered out in these widespread villages and your kids move hundreds of miles away and your friends are all somewhere else and there's no sense of community and of being a part of each other, just being alone and being abandoned. Maybe, maybe they were afraid. I'm sure the stories had been handed down, the stories of violence before the flood, and they were still fresh as their, their fathers and grandfathers told them those stories. And they were thinking, if we stick together, if we just kind of all band together, we can protect ourselves. Whatever might have been in the back of their mind, I know what they said. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Let's make a name for ourselves. Let's, let's have honor and glory and admiration. And let's have power and privilege and wealth. We'll be great. We, we can take care of ourselves. We don't need anybody. God, I know, has commanded us to spread out and fill the earth, but we know better. We know what it really takes, and and we can take care of ourselves. Now, I have no doubt that out of this came a lot of bad things. Right off the bat would come hierarchy. I mean, the building of this, this ziggurat, this building of this tower, this temple, did not just happen because everybody got together and each man had a vote and each person had a vote. After all, somebody has to supervise the construction of this temple. Somebody has to organize getting all the bricks together. Somebody has to organize the resources and, and feeding all these people. And I can hear somebody say, I don't care if you are industrious. I don't care if you are smart. I don't care if you're stronger than I am. And I don't care if you think you're as smart as I am. You were born a drone and you'll remain a drone. And that's just the way the world is. And the whip cracks and clubs thump on worn out bodies. And the leaders smile watching the workers building their temple. Slavery. Building a temple on this scale means exhausting, time-consuming labor. Where are we going to get people who work this hard? Where are we going to get people who will put up with, with what it takes to actually get this done? Where will we get people who will do what needs to be done when they're hungry and when they're tired? How do we hire workers who will work ne for next to nothing and workers that we can starve and overwork and just use up like so many animals? Out of that came taxes. Not Texas, but taxes. Who, after all, is going to pay for this? I mean, the workers have to be fed. They're working. They don't have time to get out and go running around all over the place and look for food. They can't grow their own food. They're too busy making bricks and building towers. And the farmers, the farmers are going to have to be paid. Well, you know, they're going to have to take what we're willing to give them. And we may have to show a little bit of military muscle to get out there and take away the things that they want to sell to us at a dear price. But after all, we're making a name for ourselves. After all, we're, we're, we're trying to be famous and powerful and big. And there's just a lot of bad stuff that comes from building towers up to heaven. The world has been destroyed once before because God sickened of all of the violence and injustice. And here we go again. They were building a tower, they said, that reached to the heavens. That's a big tower. That's, that's, a, that's a tall rascal. That thing is bigger than anything I can imagine. But the Lord came down to see the tower the people were building. They thought they were making this great name for themselves, and they were really raising up some, some, a reputation, and people everywhere would hear of them and, 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 and really be impressed by them. And God puts his hand to his ear and leans over and said, did I hear somebody say something? Is, is somebody, somebody down there making noise? 
They thought they were building this massive, majestic building, and, and God stoops over, and then finally he gets down on his hands and knees, and he begins to comb through the grass and bend low to the ground, and finally he says, oh, there it is. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they'll not understand each other. And that is not the Lord's statement about human dignity and human power and human intellectual ability. If we can just all get together, if we could all just get on the same page, if we could all just kind of speak the same language, we could accomplish the impossible. We could do anything. Rather, this is God's horror at pride and presumption on the part of human beings. If, if when they actually start to talk one another, to one another, they're capable of this, can you imagine what they'll do if I just let this go? So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. We know then what Jesus meant when he said, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. They, they wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted people to be impressed by how great and powerful and how hardworking and how smart they were and how, how big they were. And instead, everybody who passes by that place now can be impressed, not, by, not so much by how massive the building was, but all they can remember is the end, the humiliation, and the defeat. Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote a poem, Ozymandias goes like this, I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage, a visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of coal command tell that its sculptor well understood those passions red, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. How many eternal kingdoms have come and gone in human history? Kings and peoples who flexed their muscles and, 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 and conquered far and wide and thought, this, this, this nation will last for a thousand years. And it didn't last for 40 whose statues lie in broken heaps, whose cities lie in ruins, testimony to human pride and human power and human futility. And what that tells me is it is foolish to pick a fight with God. To think that somehow, some way, we're going to whip God and we're going to best him or we're going to outsmart him and get around him and build a life of our own, that we're going to turn our backs on God and make our own rules and live by our own standards and our own wisdom, that we will refuse to listen to him and refuse to give him honor and insult him and ignore him and do our best to get along without him and think that we can win that fight. Jesus said it this way, what king in his right mind declares war on another king without first figuring out if he has enough soldiers to win? And if he doesn't, he does everything he can to maintain peace. In Luke chapter 14, it begins in verse 15. Jesus had finished poking fun at the pretensions of the Pharisees. He's, he's watching them as they come into these banquets and, and they're fighting over se uh, seats. They're fighting over the, the most honorable places at these banquets. And, and, and there's all kinds of little wrestling matches that are taking place. As somebody gets in too high a seat and, and somebody else wants to fight him for it and shove him down a few places. And 
Jesus said, stop worrying about that stuff. Stop honoring yourself and learn to honor others and stop trying to sit at the highest place. Instead, take the lowest place. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. It doesn't really matter where you sit, does it? The highest place or the lowest place. At least you're at the table. And I think what he really means is, cool it, Jesus. Mind your own business. Just be happy you're here. Be glad to sit at that lowest place because the one who who sits at the table in the kingdom of God is is blessed. Even if you're at the foot of the table. So just, just knock it off and leave us alone. And Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who'd been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the, then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. It doesn't matter where you sit, just as long as you're there. The problem is, Jesus replied, the problem is that people who are invited are often so worried about their honor and about looking good and about being somebody that they insult the host. They insult God by not coming to the banquet in the first place. Instead, they try to be out, uh, they're, they're out trying to be big shots and they're trying to take care of themselves. I just bought a field. See, right here in the headlines, it says wealthy entrepreneur owns largest ranch in the country and I can't waste time coming to your your lowly banquet I have too much to do too many things to take care of I have to go out and see my field I've just bought five yoke of oxen Whew, five yoke of oxen wow well what do you have to pay for five yoke of oxen oh three four hundred thousand dollars in today's money I guess Wow, you have that kind of money to throw around? Well, I'm sorry, I don't have time to come to your little party. I have bigger fish to fry and an oxen to show off at the local auction pool. I just got married. You just, you just got married? Well, that's a pretty good reason for not coming to my banquet, all right. But didn't you think to tell me that you were getting married when you accepted my invitation? You let me go to all that expense and all that trouble and all that worry making room for you and you knew you weren't coming all along? Look, who do you think you are, God or something? I told you I got married. I'm not coming. Just live with it. So the master of the banquet is humiliated but not defeated. Infuriated, he sent his servant out to bring in all the unclean, unacceptable people in town, the poor the crippled, the blind, the lame, who are considered by the Pharisees to be, to be unclean. They can't participate in temple worship, and, 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 and they can't really be associated with, and they're unredeemable. These are the people who shame you when you eat with them. They don't bring you honor. But the master of the banquet shows his contempt for these people who refuse to come to his banquet by bringing in all these lowly people. And he gains honor by showing honor to people who have no way to get honor for themselves. I tell you, says the master of the banquet, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Doesn't matter where you sit, someone said, as long as you're there. Well, maybe so, said Jesus, but it matters if you come. 
inside the Messianic banquet is going on. Eternal life and God's blessing and all of the rich food that God can provide. Joy and love and honor and peace and value and happiness. And outside are the people who thought they could do without God. And so they picked a fight with him. It is, it is foolish to pick a fight with God. So Jesus warns all those people who are following him, hoping, hoping that they will be honored by God, hoping that they will be invited to the great messianic banquet. And they're following Jesus all over the place. There are just loads of these folks. And Jesus turns to them and says, listen, don't insult God. If you think anything is more important... If you think anything is more honorable than God, then don't even bother. Just go home right now. And he runs down the list. Father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister. And yes, and then he goes back to the top of the list, and your own life. If family loyalties mean more to you than God, he says, you can't be my disciple. Now, for most of us, that's not an issue. I, our families pretty much allow us to lead our own lives and make our own commitments and and they support us in those things, and even if we hurt their feelings a little bit, that's not our experience. We don't have families behind us who are dragging us down and trying to keep us from serving Jesus. I, I can't imagine what it would be like to be a part of a Muslim family and then to convert to Christ and, and know how difficult that can be. I mean, my, my following Christ and my family obligations go together without conflict. But do we insult God? How do we insult God? We, we do it, I suppose, by our language sometimes when we dishonor God by the curses and the filth that so easily come out of our mouth. We insult God, I suppose, by our anger when we lash out and hurt the very people that God loves the most. We do it, we insult God with our sins, I suppose. Doing things that we know God is displeased with and things that say, I don't care about you. I only care about me. That's what's important right at the moment. And even though we know we're going to be ashamed later when we do this stuff, we do it anyway. And we insult God. How, how do you insult God? I, I don't think it would be too hard to make a list, would it? If, if you all just sat down with your own list and just started saying, look, at this is the way. Probably in the last week or so, you could just write this huge list of things. This is how I insult God. It is, <clears throat> it is foolish to pick a fight with God. And God is huge for one thing, and we're so small. You know, I, I, I read that story of the, the people trying to build the Tower of Babel, and they're thinking, we're going to build this tower up to the heavens. And so, I mean, I'm sure they were looking up. I've seen pictures, you know, of artist conceptions as they, they show this little ziggurat, and it always goes up into the clouds. There's always clouds floating around the top of this thing, you know. I mean, people are, it's way up there. It's big, and God has to bend over to see it. Because it's just, it's just so small and so hard to see for God. God is about truly important things, and we get wrapped up in so much insignificant stuff. God is worth giving up everything for, says Jesus. And we still insist on chasing around after stuff that doesn't last and that doesn't really matter. I remember hearing one time about a headstone in Forest Lawn. A man had died, buried there in Forest Lawn, very wealthy section of Forest Lawn Cemetery. And on his headstone are three numbers. Two, three, five. His bowling average. Now can you imagine the family as they get together and all his friends and they're standing around and they're talking about old Fred? What do you think we ought to put on Fred's headstone that would really make a difference? And somebody says, put his bowling average. That's all he really cared about. Those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. And that's not about God's pride or God's feelings or some petty insistence that, some, that people have to suffer. You've got to pay for it. If you're going to follow God, you've got to pay for it. 
This is about God inviting you to his banquet. Where everything is perfect and everything is important and everything is fulfilling and everything makes your life exactly what it was created to be. It is silly to pick a fight with God. On the one hand, you're going to lose. But on top of that, after all of that hard work of trying to make something out of yourself and be somebody, and you wind up with nothing. And you wind up as nothing. And Jesus turned to these people who were following and said, Listen, if, if you come to me and you don't hate your father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and your own life and give up all your possessions, you can't be my disciple. It's about honor, honoring God, bringing glory to God. It's about, it's about enhancing God's reputation with our lives. And so the invitation of Jesus is to honor him all the time with everything you have and everything you are because God delights to honor those who honor him. Would you stand, please? And if you need to come to Jesus, please come. See.